Recently, I visited Melbourne, Victoria, a city known for trams, and I thought I'd never cycle in Melbourne, because I was going to live near the CBD. I'd say that was an ignorant take of me back then, because the CBD I was most familiar with is one with mono-use skyscrapers bisected by 50 to 60 km per hour 5-lane unidirectional roads, with little at great pedestrian crossings. You know, the kind of true fare that you walk through only because you need to and not want to. Even though it has been levelled, hardly anyone cycles there because it is simply too dangerous, and when cycling infrastructure exists, they are often of rather questionable benefit for people cycling. Visiting Melbourne's CBD changed all of that. The streets are narrow, and they have low speed limits of 30 to 40 km per hour. Public transit runs down the median of the street, and has transit signal priority. Local shops and businesses line them, and they are filled with life. Street crossings are short, and traffic signals automatically turn green for pedestrians. You don't have to beg for them. And more importantly, something that I wasn't expecting to see. Cycling infrastructure, and the number of people cycling. My first impression of cycling in Melbourne is this shared bike bus lane on the bus to Broad Meadows. Not a very good start. It is no surprise that few but brave people cycle here. However, in the CBD, it's a different story. Here, public transport is the predominant mode of travel, with cycling making up 4% of the modal share. The hilly nature of the city is reflected in the choice of bicycles locals use. Many opt for electric bikes, sporty bikes, and shared electric scooters. Yep, electric scooters! Not fighting with pedestrians on footpaths, but legal to ride on the road. What a pleasant sight to see! I also saw a few people who were riding electric cargo bicycles, and a kind gentleman even offered to help me out with getting around. There's also another problem with shared mobility devices in Melbourne. The Australian Mandatory Helmet Law. I've talked about the health implications that come with such a law in another video, but on the practical side, some shared devices were missing helmets, making them illegal to ride. And these helmets can be found in the most random places, like at this corner, east of Flinders Street Station. However, with various types of bicycle infrastructure around, how could I say no to cycling? So I rented an Oma Feeds from a shop near the CBD, mounted my phone, and off I went. I couldn't find a better spot to mount my phone, so please bear with these cables in my POV shots. There are three prominent types of cycling infrastructure in Melbourne. On-road unprotected bicycle lanes, on-road protected bicycle lanes, and off-road shared paths. Unprotected bicycle lanes are rather common, and their width vary quite a bit in different areas of the city. A narrow lane like this causes drivers to unintentionally pass closely, which is scary and intimidating for newer bicycle users. Place one next to parked cars, and that places cyclists right in the door zone, and that is also very dangerous. Using a buffer can alleviate this issue. There is, however, one drawback with unprotected lanes. Because they are just paint, they do not stop people from parking their cars in them. With the addition of concrete slabs, protected bicycle lanes can be made, and they are much more pleasant and safer to cycle on. However, when there are breaks between the slabs, they do not prevent motorcyclists from entering them. These lanes are nice, especially when there's a car traffic jam next to it, and the ability to overtake gives people strong feelings of power. Red bike bus lanes are not ideal. Buses and bikes can have a similar average speed, but the different speed patterns can result in bus-bike conflicts. Off-road shared paths like this along the Yarra River allow people of all levels of confidence cycling to use them. Connecting segregated and shared paths seem okay, and it sure is a good sign when people feel so safe cycling here that some choose not to don safety gear. There are several elements used at intersections to make crossing them safer and simpler. Junctions tend to have a mix of them, and the degrees of protection vary. A bicycle box like this gives bicycle users a head start and places them in clear view of a driver waiting behind. When turning right, a slot for a hook turn may be available. This eliminates the need to filter to the rightmost lane. Labels for such turns can be found on the ground, and this street even has kilometer markings. Some junctions even allow buses to make a U-turn from the leftmost lane, and I find this a really great idea. 
transitions from on-road to off-road paths are generally okay. The reason for this is to connect to the off-road bay trail. Roundabouts can be fitted with unprotected bicycle lanes, and bicycles have priority over others wanting to enter the roundabout. However, when the link is missing, things can get confusing. A raised hum forces drivers entering and exiting the roundabout to slow down, and walking and cycling takes priority here. Some people use the bicycle lane, though perhaps due to the number of turns required to go a quarter way around the roundabout, others choose to avoid it. At many intersections, you are on your own when crossing them. Some paint can help to improve visibility. Mid-block crossings have segregated bicycle and pedestrian crossings, even at places where the paths are shared. These crossings along the Yara River are wide and accommodate the high volume of pedestrian activity. I've also found many junctions where a middle island is constructed. This allows people to check for approaching cars one direction at a time. And when these crossings connect segregated paths, they improve clarity, reduce conflict points, and are a joy to use. By the way, I was also really amazed at how the traffic lights function. Signals in the CBD automatically turn green for pedestrians, and there are signs telling you when that happens. In the suburbs, they do not come green automatically, but at a car-centric junction with a slip road, you can get a green immediately, even if you arrive at the junction slightly later. This makes so much sense, because there are no conflict points. Even if you miss the first green man face, you can request for another, and the walk signal will be extended just for you. I was in total amazement when I first experienced it, because Singapore's traffic signals are stupid, and they leave you waiting under the hot sun for an entire cycle for no good reason. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I hate discontinuous sidewalks with a passion. The constant need to start and stop makes cycling more tiring, and they pose challenges to the elders and wheelchair users. In Victoria, pedestrians and cyclists going straight have priority over drivers turning into side streets, and that's just wonderful. This is how it's like on an on-road cycling lane. Notice how the crossing for pedestrians remains at sidewalk level. The same is also done for off-road shared paths. And it makes clear to all users about who has priority. This is a small detail, but it vastly improves the walking and cycling experience. Median transit lanes in the CBD are great. They prevent transit from getting stuck behind turning cars, and the installation of transit signal priority has decreased travel times by 6 to 10%. Believe it or not, even car drivers benefit from this scheme. Median transit lanes also have one hidden advantage. Street corner radiuses can now be made tighter. This forces drivers to slow down and reduces the distance a person has to walk to cross the street. Putting transit stops in the middle also allow people to continue walking straight instead of a detour around the stop. Here are the differences in turning out from a side street between Singapore and Melbourne. In Singapore, because the sidewalks are discontinuous, you might not even realise that people walking and cycling are going to cross here. Because there are no level changes, this shifts one's focus away from looking out for pedestrians and cyclists to yielding to vehicular traffic on the main road. Add in a humongous turning radius, and there is little incentive to slow down or stop, and it shows when no one bothers stopping at the stop line. This makes it dangerous not only for pedestrians and cyclists, but also drivers. As I approach a transit stop on a bike, there is a huge mixing zone despite there being only one exit for people walking. It is ambiguous and unclear, and because our paths switch between mixing and segregating so often, people don't care about sticking to their own paths. It is so much better in Melbourne, and here is how it's like travelling on one. As I exit the side street, a continuous sidewalk makes it clear that people walking have priority. Because I have to go up to sidewalk level and back down to road level before making a sharp turn, this forces me to slow down twice, making it safer for everyone. As I approach a transit stop, a zebra crossing demarcates where priority needs to be given very clearly. 
there are several parking spots in Melbourne City. Some of these spaces used to be for cars too. It's also nice to see integration between cycling and public transit with secure, sheltered bicycle parking near bus and train stations like these. Some stations even have bicycle parking on the platforms themselves. That's truly a luxury. Installing new bicycle paths is a common way to increase the uptake of cycling in cities around the world. However, let's not forget that the only reason that we need pedestrian infrastructure and cycling infrastructure is because of the dangers cars possess. And the most important segment of a walk-cycle-ride plan is the car plan. So when the volume and speed of cars are decreased, so does the cost of constructing cycling infrastructure. When I was cycling in Fitzroy, I wondered why there were so few people cycling along this route. I soon found out that it's not just because the lane is unprotected and narrow, it's that the locals were just a block across on Napier Street. This is a shared traffic bike lane, or better known as a bicycle boulevard. Even though there is no legislative framework that prioritizes cycling over cars, signs like this legitimize routes that everyday locals use, and changes over the years have made cycling on such routes safer and more convenient. A simple modal filter like this allows pedestrians and cyclists to travel down the street with ease, while restricting the flow of car traffic to local access. Taking full width of the lane when on a roundabout is also encouraged with the presence of shadows. At an intersection with a busy road, there are dedicated bicycle waiting areas and bicycle signals that have their own signal phase. Look at how the light turns green for pedestrians and cyclists, but not for drivers. This eliminates all conflict points at an intersection. How lovely is that? A different kind of modal filter like this at Barclay Street helps to reduce cycling distances. People at the intersection of Nicholson Street and Elgin Street can use this shortcut to get to Rathdown Street quicker than driving. I also really appreciate how entering one-way streets the wrong way and making specific turns at certain junctions are prohibited, unless you're riding a bicycle. Melbourne's recent Little Streets initiative has reduced speed limits of Little Streets in the CBD to 20 km per hour, with certain traffic calming elements only applicable to vehicles with four and more wheels. Little Streets are rather interesting, and I'll make a video about them sometime soon. The street I found the nicest in Melbourne is none other than the biggest one that was wiped off the map. Swanston Street used to be a street open to true traffic, but cars were banned from there since 2013. Today, it is a major bicycle and tram priority route, and has seen an increase of pedestrian volumes by 24%. Delivery vehicles are still allowed during certain hours of the day. The golden rule when cycling here is to stop when the tram stops, and many locals obey it. Plus, there's no need to beg for a green signal. Traffic detection loops commonly used for cars are also used to detect bicycles, and they adjust the traffic signal accordingly. If you'd like to learn more about this street, be sure to check out Julian O'Shea's video. While I've visited many calm and lively streets of Melbourne, make no mistake that it is a sprawly city, and this is also Melbourne. And just like many other cities, there's also bike clash, especially because space for cycling is correctly taken from cars and not from people walking. At one point, there was so much bike clash that the mayor, Sally Cap, decided to pause construction of protected cycle lanes in the CBD, ironically, on World Bicycle Day. The reason I drew comparisons between Melbourne and Singapore so much is because both cities have many similarities at first glance. Not only do both cities travel on the same side of the road, they have the same transit companies, design of traffic light push buttons, and they even sound the same. But the vastly different attitudes and small differences between both cities result in vastly different user experiences. And in Melbourne, I didn't feel that my mode of travel was something being dealt with, but rather, accommodated for. It's the respect that you get as a bicycle user with priority over cars coming out from side streets and the clarity where priority needs to be given. It's the respect you get as a person walking down the street, the continuous sidewalks, not having to contest for space with people cycling, the small turning radiuses that force drivers to slow down, traffic signals that automatically turn green in the city, and even in the suburb, they turn green immediately for you, which never happens in Singapore. 
and it's the respect you get as a transit user. Schedules which are not hidden from public view, allowing people to plan journeys in advance. Median transit lanes so that transit doesn't get slowed down by turning cars. And transit signal priority, which believe it or not, also makes car travel better. It is obvious that Melbourne's infrastructure is nowhere as polished as Singapore's. But it's the different attitudes between both cities that stand out. One has the will to challenge the status quo, where space for cycling is taken back from cars and not stolen from the already narrow sidewalks. The understanding that it's not just metrics that matter, but user experience and fundamentals that go a long way. One city viewed COVID-19 as an excuse to reopen pedestrianised streets to cars. Another city viewed COVID-19 as an opportunity to widen sidewalks so people have more personal space and also created little streets. Melbourne is currently in a transition to becoming a more walkable and bikeable city. A transition in the right direction that is not just commendable, but also inspiring. With the presence of advocacy groups championing bikeability and livability, I hope that cycling in Melbourne becomes a more popular mode of travel that can be enjoyed by people of today and people of tomorrow. Hey, thanks for watching this video. Special thanks to my patrons who have made this video possible. If you enjoy watching my content, please consider subscribing. And if you feel that my videos are worth your money, I have a Patreon page linked in the description. Once again, thanks for watching and see you real soon.